uh, in his uh, latest concerns. Uh, Dr. Farijan is asking the Electoral Commission to consider the guarantor system. While he's not the only one raising the concern, the opposition uh, NDC is equally concerned about the EC's proposed CIA, reason for which they've launched uh, Operation Save Our Democracy. Well, I caught up with the national chairperson of the NDC, Johnson Asiedi and Ketia, just to find out what the essence of this exercise is. You see, uh, in Ghana, we are facing two major problems. Our economy is in crisis, and we need to rescue the economy. In the same way, our democracy is in crisis. So we need to rescue our democracy. So, and we think that the efforts to undertake these two rescue missions must go hand in hand. If you have a democracy, the reason why democracy is attractive to many is that you give people, you select your own leaders. Nobody imposes leaders on you. That's one, the principle of self-determination. Right. And then, because it's a representative democracy, your leaders are given, uh, assigned a responsibility, like a social contract, right. go and do this, and then we will assess you at the end of four years. Right. And then we take a decision whether you have discharged that responsibility, in which case we may retain you. If you have failed to discharge that responsibility, your balance sheet shows that we must bring another set of leaders mm -hmm. to, to take over. That principle, if we take it out of any democracy, what is left is not democracy. So there are ways of taking that away. One, if you block the means, legitimate means, where citizens can exercise the right to change governments and put in other government. If you block that chance, you are about to destroy the democracy. Now, in a democracy, institutions are more, must be more powerful than individuals and men. So the quality of every democracy depends on how strong their institutions are independent and they are able to hold their own against efforts by dictators or tyrants to manipulate them. Where we are now, our institutions have been bastardized and weakened to an extent that there, there is barely an institution that can stand on its own. And citizens are finding it difficult to separate institutions from the government in power. And that is a danger to our democracy. And again, you have a situation where certain actions are being done to suggest that the right of citizens to choose their leaders mm -hmm. is being compromised. And then you have this bad economy. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have an economy that is collapsing, mm -hmm. and the way citizens can react to solve the problem at times is to change the people who are in the driving seat mm -hmm. so that new set of people will come and then they will do the work better. Right. So if we are taking decisions that seems to block the opportunity of citizens to replace their leaders, mm -hmm. then it is even more dangerous than the collapsed economy. So that is why we have declared Operation Save Our Democracy. We see the constitutional instrument mm -hmm. that is before parliament now, in its current form, has a very dangerous tool. You know, it's like our institutions are being weaponized against the citizens. 
So we are saying that let us sort out the issues around that CI mm -hmm. first. Because it has to deal with the right of citizens okay. to change their leaders or maintain their mm -hmm. leaders. Now, if leaders who have messed up now come to get the confidence that the citizens are powerless to take any decision to change them, and they are asking the citizens to give them more money, would you give that money? So what we have in Parliament now, mm -hmm. you have uh, issues to do with IMF package mm -hmm. and the others. Mm -hmm. And everybody is singing around the place as if approving the IMF package is more of a national emergency mm. than fixing our democracy. Right. We in NDC disagree. Mm. We think that fixing our democracy is of a higher priority. Mm -hmm. Because once the leaders who are messing up, if we have control over who uses our resources mm -hmm. and those people get the feeling that they are accountable to us that is where we can give them more money mm -hmm. because they cannot mess up with the money but if you people who have messed up and they are taking steps to block any opportunity of calling them to account mm -hmm. and you agree that oh let's block let's leave the 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 effort to hold them accountable mm. and let's focus on giving them more resources it's like going to fetch water in a, in a basket General, that, that document you're talking about i mean when it all started um every Ghanaian was focused on the controversial part which has got to do with the use of the ghana card uh, as sole document for registering or getting onto the electoral roll Aside this very concern, uh, is the NDC having any other issue about, about uh, the CI in its entirety, aside the issue of the Ghana card? Because the chairperson was in is the house, where you she are, says they are not using the card, okay, for instance. Where for you are feeling as role. a media, right. as a media and others, is that before you make any new law, the first thing you do is what is wrong with the existing system which I'm seeking to correct? Can you take a brand new vehicle to a workshop and then say that I have to change, uh, you have to work on my vehicle? They ask you what is wrong with the vehicles, I don't know. They might think there's something wrong upstairs. So the Electoral Commission has so far not told Ghanaians, what is wrong with the existing law? The chairperson has been to parliament. She says they want to do away with, for instance, the guarantor system mm -hmm. and that the Ghana card is part of that solution. Why are they doing away with the guarantor system when the guarantor system is used to procure the Ghana card itself, which you want to use? Is the guarantor system good or bad? The guarantor system cannot be bad, uh, cannot be good when you are using it to procure the national ID card. And then when you want to register people using the national ID card, you certainly feel that the guarantor system is bad. It's like somebody who declares that uh, he doesn't want to eat maize or corn. And yet he can eat kenke or banku. Because if they believe that the guarantor system, you know, the argument has gone 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. When they, they were thinking about using the guarantor system for the procurement of the uh, Ghana card, right. we were insisting that we already have the old register, which is biometric, and which covers everybody from 18 years and above. So that is the biggest 
biometric database you had. The banks had bought into it, other organizations had right. bought into it. So we must use that as a basis to now find ways of dealing with the under, under 18. Right. Because the birth certificates of people under 18 are more likely to be genuine because by the time 18 years ago, we were already in serious record keeping right. at uh, you know, the hospitals and so on. So, but this um, voters register, biometric voters register, which was procured through a rigorous system where you have, uh, you know, um, party representatives, you have an adjudication system to deal with challenges and all that. You say, no, 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 the guarantee system is far superior to the biometric database as contained in the, the voters register as it existed at that time. So what has changed? That all of a sudden, you find everything wrong with the same guarantee system when it is being used for voter register. General, what's the fear of the NDC? Because no, no, no. Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, it's not about point. the fear. Right. Mm -hmm. Listen, right. if somebody is about to destroy something and you are there, you have a responsibility as a good citizen, whether your direct interest is at stake or not, to act. Otherwise, you'll be found guilty <laughs> of the same crime. If you see somebody killing another person and you have power to restrain that person and you refuse to act, when later they are looking for the murderers, you are an accomplice. I was asking the question because, so, and, and if you just allow me, I was asking mm -hmm. the question because initially mm -hmm. the concern about the NIA cards mm -hmm. was the indebtedness issue. The finance minister has come to parliament. He says, I'll make funding available so they can print all of the cards. So why not rather urge those who are prospective voters to go through the process, acquire the Ghana cards, and get onto the electoral roll? It's as simple are, as that, isn't it? Are you from an urban place or you are from the rural area i now live in an urban area mm -hmm. so, yes. find time and visit your village and go and find out what is happening there about this registration they are making noise about nothing is happening mm. nothing is happening but you see the bottom line is that you know the constitution has specifically says that no other authority or person should compile data that will be used for, voter, uh, for, for voting in this country. It's there, black and white. So the debate at the time of the establishment of NIA and all that during President Kofor's time, our position, go and look at the records in Parliament, our position was that we are likely to be using the NI, the, the citizens' card, ah, if we right. eventually have, that. Uh, have it for voting. So why don't we expand the electoral commission? Create a department that will be responsible for registration of citizens. So if they complete the process and we are to use the card for other things and also for voting, it will not be a problem. It was a huge debate. President Kufu at that time said, no, we must establish a separate national identification thing. So our position has always been that if we will be using it to vote, let that constitutional body take charge and do it so that we can use it. They said, no, it will not be used for that. So everybody has the belief that they will respect that constitutional provision. Mm -hmm. Now they want to use it. In fact, if it is completed and everybody has it, we will be the first to clamor for its exclusive use. Mm -hmm. You see, the idea of its use is not bad, but its use is different from its abuse. You understand? What they are doing is to try to abuse it. Mm. If everybody is properly registered, and the law we passed, we passed it, and said that the 
citizen's card, when issued, mm -hmm. will then be used for voting. When issued means there is somebody who issue it. Mm. We didn't say it is the responsibility of the citizen to issue the card to himself. So it is the responsibility of government to issue that card, or state authorities to issue that card. So if you issued it, and all citizens have it, if you want to use it to identify citizens, you don't have any problem. But where you have failed in your duty to issue it, and there are about two million people who don't have that card, and you think they must be punished with disenfranchisement because they don't have the card which you have failed to issue. Is that fair? But the, C, uh, the, the EC is not backing down. The, the chairperson listen, says listen, they'll, they'll, me, go, let, they'll go ahead let with me, the process. Let mm. me tell you. Right. The EC cannot declare itself independent of the state. They are designed to be independent of government, but not the state. Mm. There are two different things. Every state institution is accountable to the state. So if they don't understand their independence, <laughs> they should go and revise their notes. We establish the institutions of governance to serve the state. So no state institution can declare itself independent of the state. Mm. We design the constitution to make some institutions independent so that they can perform their role without encroachment from other people so right. that they can serve the state. We didn't design those institutions to be independent of the state. So where state structures are legitimately cautioning you that don't do this, that is not where the interest of the state lies. If you defy it, you are pursuing your personal interests and not state interests. So it is parliament that passes the laws. Mm -hmm. And now if Parliament is refusing to pass the law, what will the Electoral Commission do? Because, I, and I believe that mm. Parliament in refusing to pass the law are acting in the interest of state. But the because if you, have, mm -hmm. if you have a CI which you cannot find any fault with, you are not able to face the cameras to tell people that these are the problems we are trying to solve. And you just feel that because we are independent, this is what we want to do. There's other state institutions will not allow you because other state institutions serve as a check on you. Mm. So state institutions are designed to check each other. But, that but, is why yeah. judiciary mm. at times will come in to check executive and this will check this, that will check this. Mm. That is... That, that is what it is. So what is playing out there is good for our democracy, that we must do this. First, we have said that using the Ghana card is good, but using Ghana card exclusively will disenfranchise a certain number of Kenyans. And the Electoral Commission is under constitutional obligations to implement programs that to expand voter registration. Right. So where you find a state institution acting to limit the implementation or application of our constitution, mm -hmm. then that institution is acting wrongly. It is the constitution that created electoral commission. Mm -hmm. And the same constitution assigned them functions and say that undertake programs that will expand voter registration. And now you get up and say, I am undertaking this program that will limit voter registration. But the majority side appears to be backing the Electoral Commission. Uh, in fact, the majority leader of CHM and Sabonsu says you're basically sabotaging uh, the work of the EC and paraphrasing him. And then he goes ahead to say that no one could, can stop government mm -hmm. business okay. from being laid that, uh, on the that, floor of, that is, of parliament. Where, and he says, well, they'll go see, ahead that to, is to where, lay the CI and no one that can is stop where, them. That is where he has posed 
what the majority has been doing all along and be covering up. The business of electoral commission is an independent state business. It's not government business. So if majority and people in MPP think that working to make sure that the business of an independent state institution is done properly, conducted properly, to serve the interests of all Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. And people in government find fault and they equate that thing to frustrating government business. It tells you that they believe that electoral commission business is government business. And that tells you that the electoral commission is working to project government interests. Uh, how fair is that? Because uh, you've, but, been, you've, but, been, you've been in parliament, you uh, know but the But you are saying that, that you are saying it. Yes. I'm judging you he, by your own Precisely Bible. what he says. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, these are the words of the, of the majority. Precisely. Leader. So yes, go but, and ask him. <laughs> can't he get a difference between, mm -hmm. can't he get mm -hmm. a delineation of where government business ends mm -hmm and where state business begins. You have been a member are, of parliament when we are talking you, you, about, you know that obviously, that the, the, the processes that will start with the majority, commission majority business leader leading is that. not government business. Any person, either in the majority or anywhere, who considers electoral commission business to be government business, is part of the process of reducing confidence of other people who are not in government. In the electoral commission. So it should not be seen as government business. Mm. Listen, the work of electoral commission has to do with allocation of power. It doesn't have to do with how power is exercised. When they allocate power, they are finished with their business. And so when it comes to allocation of power, all contestants for that power must be heard. And so you can't say that because somebody is for the time being utilizing that power. Mm -hmm. So he's the person who must be heard always, even in subsequent allocation of that power. If you do that, then you are building a one-party state. And we have specifically banned one-party state mm. in our constitution. And so please, now, coming to this issue yes. of NIA says they will do this, go and play back the interview I held with your network, right. and I did the same with uh, Asempa and other networks, that when we are talking about the number of people who don't have the Ghana card, in fact, I was sitting in a program mm -hmm. where they, they read a communique that has been issued by NIA, right. signed by Professor Atefa, mm -hmm. insisting that they have credible processes in place that will ensure that by December 2022, every Ghanaian will get their card. And I was asked by the host that, does that give me comfort? Can we rely on what the NI has said. I said no. Because the, 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 the cause of the problem is lack of trust between us and NI and other state institutions. So now we are proceeding on the basis of what we can see and verify. So if they think their, uh, their, uh, their promise is credible, mm -hmm. between that September when I was talking and December, it's three months, no election will happen. They should wait and give everybody the Ghana card. So by December 2022, if we see that everybody has the Ghana card, we will allow the CI to pass. Where are we now? We are approaching March ending 2023. And they are still replacing those promises with other promises. Mm. In other jurisdictions, Atefwa have resigned. Oh, really? Yes, because we are discussing state business, and you come and swear on your honor that this is what we have put in place. We can confirm that this thing is this. So we are calling on all parties to buy into the Electoral Commission agenda. It is state business, and we must all cooperate 
to make it happen. I am going to play this part. Within three months. Now we are six months and over. It hasn't what you promised six months ago hasn't happened. And you think that you are entitled to be listened to, to give further promises. But let me tell you what. Uh, there is no controversy now about who the unregistered people are likely to be in right. terms of their political affiliation and other things. Because when we're complaining about the fact that everybody must get Ghana card before we use it for voting, McMenu and Electoral Commission, Srebo and the others, their first argument was, now who calls them? Mm. Is it not NDC people who issued a directive that their, your people should not register? So now, if you don't have it, are you not the cause? When I came, so, and I asked them simple question. Yeah. So if you believe that those who have been registered, because if I issue a communique, uh, people outside the NDC have no uh, you know, obligation to, so that, to listen to my communique and act. So it is, if you say that people did not register because they listened to my communique, yeah. it means that NDC people are the ones who didn't register. Right. So now you are pushing this agenda because you feel that it is NDC people who didn't register. So if we, it succeeds, then you are cutting NDC votes away. When I ask them those questions, they now realize that hey, mm. they are working in dangerous waters. But that is what is out of the abundance of what is in their heart mm. comes out of their mouth. Mm. So everybody now knows that. Uh, it is an agenda to restrict, you know, the, the, the voting of other people mm. so that the election can be won even before we go to ballot. Yeah, but what, is, back, what, what, dangerous, what is dangerous about what is happening is that, you see, this government through its policies have made life uncomfortable to pensioners, that is 60 years and above, that segment. And for the first time in our history, we have seen people holding working states to go and pick it at the finance ministry. They have made life difficult for people within the working population because there is the middle class and the economically active population who are supposed to carry the burdens of the others who, you know, aged and, and, and under 18 and so on. Now there are investment in bonds and other things, and this haircut and all this. Unemployment issues are lacking there. In inflation is impacting on the working class, they can't make ends meet, and so on. So that class also have had their share of the hardship. The youth have suffering already from youth unemployment and all that. The only power they have is the power to make and unmake a government of their choice. Do you know that with the existing law, the Electoral Commission should have done limited registration in immediately we entered 2021 because we, we, the last time we did registration right. was somewhere before, before the 2020. Uh, yeah, around the middle right. of 2020. Mm. So in 2021, maybe July thereabout, they should have started registration to take care of about 1 million people who have entered the 18-year the, the bracket. They didn't do it. Then we got into 2022. They haven't done it. Another say 1 million. Now we are in 2023. 
registration hasn't happened. And instead of opening the space for some mass registration that will clear all this backlog to give the youth the power to choose their leaders. You are restricting this thing to district capitals and making the conditions so difficult that you will end up not giving access to these people. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. even if we pass this thing and they say they are going to do limited registration alone, can you imagine the queues that will even be formed at the offices of the commission? Mm -hmm. So this is a, a system that is designed to punish the youth. Because somehow, um, the, the, the change, is it change Ghana or what, what do you call it? The movement, yeah. the various movements that are coming up. They are so potent. Mm. Our national security strategy document has also mentioned that lack of trust in our electoral institution and electoral processes is a huge security, national security threat. And we are still making things worse for the youthful population that is the most explosive population. You think we are all safe? Mm. They see us as responsible for their fate. Mm. So we should better beware that we save this democracy mm. before it blows up. Okay. And that is why we have decided to do mm. our part. Uh, restricting citizens, uh, uh, voter registration to, uh, I mean, people who are holding Ghana car. It has also got its challenges, even yeah. if where every Ghanaian has it. Do you know that uh, man people have the right to get the citizen's card? Do you know that undischarged bankrupts have the right to get the citizen? But these people are not entitled to vote. Mm. So you want to issue a card to a man person, and when he presents it, even at the registration center, you can't stop him. But a, a person who is active and alert, who doesn't have the card, cannot participate in elections. So look, one source of identification document mm. is good, but don't let us misuse it. Mm. Let us go gradually and make sure that we have come to a point where there is no backlog. Mm. And to be, to be honest with you, there will never be a point where every Ghanaian 18 years and above will have the card. But the backlog, if it is cleared now, and then the continuous registration is reserved for people who get 18 years, can walk Into to the, the electoral commission and register, yeah. then we are good to go. Right. But if you, if you, you know, it will create a problem. Mm. Create General, we need to wrap up. So I'm wrapping up uh, on two concerns that I have. Uh, mm. What happens beyond the 31st of this month? Mm. Uh, because your operation is lasting until the end of the month. Yes. And you have another opportunity with the um, IPAC, the Inter-Party Advisory mm. Committee. Mm. Uh, it's a platform that was created. Mm. And you've served, you've been a member, you've attended these sessions over the years until recently when the party had some challenges with that forum. Will you use the IPAC? Um, as a means of channeling your grievances to the Electoral IPAC Commission? IPAC is one of that. the institutions that has been weaponized. In this interview, I told you that the state institutions are gradually being weaponized. So where you think that an institution has been designed for something, you go there, it has been turned into a weapon against you. So that's why we are saying that one of the biggest challenge is the weaponization of state institutions. Uh, task collection institutions and all the others, they have a way of being weaponized. Mm. If you have a tax institution that will deal ruthlessly with the opponents of a certain government, and then those who are in government, 
they work free. If you have a judicial system uh, that has been weaponized, you have practically everything. And they even want the Auditor General's office to be weaponized. Everything. So that is where the crux of the matter lies. When we said that electric, uh, the IPAC has been weaponized, let's work on it. These are the things we must work at to make sure that IPAC delivers on its mandate. If not, we are not going to be participants because nobody will be allowed to use NDC as a rubber stamp mm. for any wrong decisions. So unless the so, reforms, you would so, not know your So concerns. we put these cards on the table. Right. Luckily, when there is conflict, we have a state institution that works at the conflict to make sure that there is resolution and there is peace. And that is the National Peace Council. National Peace Council came in because they realized that the mistrust of the electoral commission and the electoral processes had been flagged in the national security strategy document to be a national security threat. And surveys upon surveys have returned a verdict that the citizens don't trust in the electoral commission and their systems. So the National Peace Council decided to do something about this. They engaged us about our possible return to the IPAC. We laid down the, the reasons. They listened to us. And they said, OK, can we put together a roadmap? We said, well, we are not alone at IPAC. Can you engage our colleagues in the other party, main party? And we are only two parties represented in parliament. So they went and engaged electric, and they went and engaged the NPP. Right. They had a fruitful meeting with NPP, and the next stage of the roadmap was to engage NDC, MPP, and Peace Council together. That meeting happened, and together we put together a roadmap for the return of IPAC to its original uh, you know, mandate. So after that meeting, the next stage was for the Peace Council to go and engage the Electoral Commission. Because after all, the Electoral Commission attitude must be that we are referees. So if the teams, the key players, agree on the rules, and say that this is what will pass as an election that will satisfy everybody. We are the players. Electoral Commission doesn't contest elections. And they are there to make sure that elections turn out to be free and fair. How do you judge the freeness or fairness of the election? You judge it by the acceptance of the, all the actors. And we say that this is what will uh, generate free and fair elections. And then you are insisting that you have some idea of what constitutes free and fair elections and that you are independent and that nobody can direct you. So, Electoral Commission has refused for 14 months now. They have refused to even grant audience to the Peace Council. You're stating this on authority. As a fact, yes. Call Peace Council. The last time I stated it, we had done eight months. People disagreed. I wanted to contest that fact. And I said, that, call the Peace Council people. Call civil society organizations in governance who also started another parallel effort aimed at achieving the same thing. IDEC, CDD, and the others, they also put together a roadmap. Electoral Commission has refused to also buy into any such roadmap. As for the Peace Council, that is not an NGO. It is another state institution that has a role to play in making sure that Ghanaians live in peace. Mm. They want to talk to you. 
another state institution. And you say you cannot meet them. Who is stopping this? Now, is the chairperson and the, 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 the members of the commission, they said, we can meet you. And they are not saying they can't meet them. Oh, we are traveling. We are doing this. Something that borders on the security of the nation. And the National Peace Council has been trying for the past 14 months to meet you, to discuss. And you turn around when you want to pass a wrong law. And they tell you, why didn't you engage NDC? You say, oh, uh, majority of parties have agreed. Who are the majority parties? Yeah. But they are political parties here. I say, who are they? That is why, well, if you are adding uh, mushroom parties and rating them uh, with the same weight as NDC, the law gets passed in parliament. There are only two parties. If you like, go and ask Akwia Donko to go and speak in parliament. You, and you're, that is you're, where not being, you're not being I, fair to the smaller parties, are you? Oh, they don't have that much at stake. Their stake in what is going to happen mm -hmm. is not as big as ours. And that is the point Electoral Commission must recognize. You understand? Right. So we are saying that, well, hard on the training grounds, easy on the battlefield. In the past, we would trash all these differences at IPAC. You, by design, want to exclude us at IPAC. We say, fine. We are waiting. Bring it to Parliament. So all the issues that should have been trashed at IPAC, they are now being dealt with in Parliament. And it amounts to a complete waste of parliamentary time. Do you know how much we pay MPs? Go and check the money the state spends on one hour of the time of parliament. And if you have other means of solving a problem outside parliament, and you make things such that those problems can only be solved in parliament, what do you think you are doing to the state? Mm. And when you get to a point where you can't pay your debts, you say you don't understand. It is from Ukraine and COVID. General, we're wrapping up. So um, the marching orders after 31st, what, what, what happens? And what's your message to they the people of They are not marching them? orders. <laughs> there are you say decisions the MPs, that the, the we MPs. have taken mm. together. Mm. And the MPs, to tell you what, the law when passed affects the MPs more than we at headquarters because they are trying to tilt the playing field against them too. So they can only retain their seats when the laws there are fair. So the battle they are engaged in is also in their personal interest as much as in the state interest. 31st March was chosen because parliament will rise at that time. And Parliament will go into recess maybe until we have finished our primaries. When we finish the primaries, they will return there and they don't have to worry about what is happening in their constituencies. So I want to state here and now that the operation it, which has been misinterpreted to mean that we are protecting our Sitting MPs, in. sitting MPs, uh, so that they will return to Parliament. Yes, we are protecting them, but we are protecting them from unfair competition. We are not protecting them mm. to engage in unfair competition. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that's uh, part one of my conversation with the national chairperson of uh, the National Democratic Congress, Johnson Asidu in Kijia. Part two of that conversation will be here on The Pulse again tomorrow as we delve into matters relating to the state of the nation and other issues confronting our country. You're watching The Pulse.
We'll be right back. We'll talk about the one district, one factory policy. There's a lot you need to know. Please stay.